Hello, hello. Uh, I'm Sven, the manager of Visavik Estonia, and uh, today's idea is uh, to generate discussion about how to survive as a deep tech startup. And today here with me is uh, Heli Valtna, CEO and founder of Lightcoat Photonics, Linda Vueras, an associate and an early stage uh, investor from Karma VC, and Donatella Bonziani from ESA, uh, the head of the commercialization gateway. And to kick off the questions, uh, first one will be to Heli. Uh, you've been here on the stage before. You won last uh, year the uh, Startup Pitching Main Award. But to go a bit back, what inspired you to start Lightcode Photonics? And what do you think is the uniqueness of your approach and why you are such a star right now regarding what you are doing with the 3D cameras? Uh, okay, thank you. So what inspired me was the problem. Uh, several years ago, I was head of autonomy development for off-road autonomy, a company called Milram. Many might know it, uh, the company here. And uh, my team was combining uh, six different modalities of sensor. It could have been like 20 different uh, sensors altogether. Uh, the price tag, we were pushing it down a uh, certain limit, what was really high. Uh, that was not, I mean, it was in the order of uh, cost of a uh, uh, new car. And, um, well, you see, like, such aut autonomy is not yet flying. And on the other hand, uh, in the general public, there was this understanding that, uh, oh, the autonomy is ready because investors are talking about it so much. <laughs> so, uh, there was actually, there was a huge uh, cap. Neither this autonomy is ready, and the autonomy is not ready because... Uh, the sensors are not ready yet. And uh, two days ago, uh, this week, we had uh, our technology demonstration. So uh, our, our company has uh, come a long way. Two years ago, we had our uh, first portable prototype, size of a log huge luggage suitcase, uh, full of technology that did cost uh, ridiculously a lot. Uh, now we have uh, changed the, all the components in, in the camera system, uh, roughly twice. Uh, by now, and uh, we have shrinked it to uh, pocket size. I mean, different people have different pockets. Uh, Rainer, Rainer Sternfeld said it's a pocket size, so you can come and see. And um, anyway, um, what we are doing is uh, we are providing this one sensor perception set for uh, robots, uh, smart machines, rovers, uh, so they could focus on what they need to do. They need to navigate. They need to fulfill their tasks. And, uh, and we have this unique solution because, well, the vision has been as it is for, from the start of times. Uh, you have your sensitive area, you have your lens, you, you make an image. Um, but uh, there's more to it. There are new sensors that can count every photon, like, uh, in a second, we are collecting, uh, my colleagues are here, Peter, maybe you can give a better number, but uh, billions of photons per second into each eye we have. So there are many, many, many of them. And uh, now we have, all of a sudden, if we send out the flashes uh, of light a uh, million times a second to see the surrounding, uh, we get a lot of information of what's out there. And uh, we can do, it, it's a gold mine of data they're coming, but first we have to build the cameras. And uh, it's, uh, we are most lucky that this new imaging principle uh, actually relies on existing technologies. So we can take the sensor off the shelf, we can take compute off the shelf, we don't have to uh, invent uh, new uh, core technologies, we just need to wire them in a new way. And uh, with two years, I mean, we are following the pace of uh, Starship. If you read from Wikipedia, in two years they got to demonstration, two and a half years they got to the paid POC. So we are following. ESA is our first paying customer, so thank you. Uh, we, are, we are going to uh, validate uh, what, needs, uh, what it takes to uh, send this camera to space. And uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, super exciting. Uh, it's uh, super inspiring, and it's uh, like reinforcing it every day to work with the team we have. So, I hope I give an answer. 
Yeah, and that brings me to the next of the idea. So, uh, Linda, when you joined the Karma VC and started working with deep tech startups, was uh, companies like Lightcoat that motivated you coming away from ISI and joining into the Karma VC to work closely with uh, young bright stars in this, uh, let's say, deep tech race that we are having right now? Yeah, I think. The, the beauty about deep tech is um, you solve really complex issues, right? These are things that fundamentally often change the way that we work, we live, the day, like our day to day. Um, you know, you can see the chat GPT craze taking over and it only took one company to change it, right? Yeah. So absolutely, you know, it kind of shows what can be done. And I think being a part of that journey, um, sometimes holding their hand, you know, opening up our wallets, obviously, as well, um, whatever is needed and supporting, I think that's a really important role. But, you know, ultimately, where the support system, the, the work is done in the companies themselves. And I think that, yeah, you're one or the other. Yeah. And uh, you already started about the ecosystem. And if you're taking uh, into the ecosystem the big players, Heli already mentioned that their first playing customer is ESA. And uh, for investors, of course, uh, ESA as a, is a huge mark of credit, uh, accreditation and uh, reassures that the company is doing things. So, Donatella, uh, what do you see uh, how ESA in general could support companies like uh, Lightcoat Photonics? And what are the main possibilities of uh, working together uh, with ESA through, let's say, incubation programs, different uh, tenders and uh, things like that? There is a wide variety of uh, solutions that he's a offer. You mentioned the business incubation center. In Europe, we have already 29 business incubation centers running uh, all over Europe. One uh, born in 2017 in Estonia as well. And we have uh, 1,400, I think, today, alumni, startup that have been working with us. This is, I think, a very useful initiative because, as you said, we have a trademark. Uh, we apply to the startup that works with us the same principle of evaluation and the quality that we apply to the, to the big player while respecting what they are doing. And I think that we, we, we helped many of them getting off the ground thanks to all this uh, network uh, of uh, business incubation center. This is one element of uh, the, the solution we can provide, but there are several others. There are, we are namely an R&D uh, agency where our competence is in project management. Sometimes we talk about the difficulty of companies in getting out of the ground because they start with very, uh, very low tier uh, um, infrastructure or element, and we are helping through different programs we have to uh, go through through the, the maturation of their program. So I think that uh, it's a complex, uh, anyway, it's a complex uh, uh, environment. The ESA one is an institutional one, but uh, we are really, it's one of, in 2020, we, we came out with a new strategic agenda, the Agenda 2025, where one of the focus and the objective is commercialization. So we are really uh, implying a lot of energy to go more and more into the direction of new space, of startup, uh, trying to adapt also our method of works, uh, our way of contra um, setting contract, which can be uh, overwhelming for some new startup, to adapt it and make it leaner. Yeah, as, as Heli already is an alum of Isabik Estonia, what could be the next steps regarding uh, doing cooperation with ESA, for example? But there, there are, as I said, there are different programs. ESA is one of the um, space agencies where the competence are spread all over the space sector. So according to, to the, the characteristic of the startup on, and the, the company, there are different uh, programs that can support uh, in form of uh, private-public partnership, who is as a customer, to the journey of uh, the startup. 
what the startup need to do is have this knowledge. This is also what we are doing in our department in the commercialization gateway. We are trying to, since as I said, and we all recognize it, we are a complex organization. We are trying to make uh, easier for startup uh, the way into it, just by knowledge, because uh, through the gateway we are trying to describe the portfolio of opportunity that you can have, okay, that can be in a telecommunication, health observation, exploration, whatever field, or technology development. And uh, through this, uh, this program, the startup can apply and can have additional support. On the top of it, this year, we are, last year, we had the, the Ministerial Council where uh, one 0.3 billion were attributed to commercialization, meaning that we are really uh, focusing on it. And uh, we had this new program, Scale Up, where we try uh, again to uh, enrich the ecosystem and work hands in hands with investors. Because uh, I think the ecosystem is changing and the, the, the startup are, uh, we cannot be the only customer. We can be an enabler but we cannot be the only customer. Uh, as Donatella said, it's easy to work with ESA. Uh, from I your experience, Heli, uh, how it's easy was, was it for you during this whole, doing the ESA big incubation and now your first customer, one of the first customers is ESA. How easy has been the process for you? I mean, it's everything, but you make it yourself. Tlaiko, this wonderful team, has uh, the best mentors and uh, the best partners on the world. And to go Very more diplomatic. <laughs> that was well said. We didn't pay for it. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it felt like an advertisement. But as you, as you mentioned already, the pilot programs, uh, how much can you share? What kind of exciting partnerships or projects are you working right now that people should know, the ESA should know, or investors should know? What are the most exciting things you're doing right now? Yeah, well, the most exciting things are in the making, right? <laughs> so it's... Uh, well, technologically, uh, when we started off, we just knew that we want to like put this sensor and that uh, projector and everything together and, and get this camera that uh, can count the photons and doesn't have any gaps between pixels. But over the time, it developed to this uh, concept that uh, our core team, uh, the founder team figured out that, yeah, but you know, we can rewire those pixels at uh, chip level. <laughs> you know what it means? I mean, we had this uh, box uh, two years ago. Now we have this Reiner pocket size, and and uh, it's a third generation concept. So half of this box we have today is optics. The second half is, is electronics. So we put optics on a custom uh, sensor, and it's half of the size. We take the next half of the compute, we put it on ASIC. Then we have size of a fingernail, a camera, a 3D camera that uh, could fit every pocket or be a size of a dice. How would uh, future rovers, uh, uh, autonomous vehicles, machines, see, see with the eyes the size of a dice? How much redundancy could you have? What, Sven, what do you think, what could you do with a 3D sensor in your pocket? Oh, I go crazy. I scan everything and see everywhere in dark. In dark? If you are in a new city. You add some AI, yeah. you, you get the information yeah. where you are, what's surrounding you. If you happen to lose your vision... Yeah, you can give an eyes to blind people. Uh-huh. Oh, what else could we do? Could we give eyes to the cities? Definitely. We can make cities smart. We, uh, cognitive. Co cooperate with sm smart cars and self-driving okay. cars. Uh, avoid accidents. Yeah, well, and, and the metaverse. Oh, uh, well, then Skynet coming. No, no Skynet. <laughs> no Skynet. <laughs> but yeah, uh, continuing the idea, Linda, now you heard the, uh, what they are planning to do, what they're doing. So uh, would this be the, the, the idea that intrigues you? Or what are the things, if you are looking from your own perspective or from your investment fund perspective, what are the ideas that you're looking for? And could this be one of the ideas that you would be able to invest in? I think the first comment that I want to make is like, I cannot imagine, as someone who has a PhD in your field, how difficult it must be to explain things to people who are, who are as dumb as me on that particular subject. 
Um, and, 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 and I think that the first thing for me, and, and, and at least in, in deep tech, is that we're a generalist, you know? Um, you see every single different field, different technology, different stack, and, you know, meetings back to back. So in 30 minutes, you start from knowing nothing maybe about a certain technology or industry, and then by the end of it, you need to get a pretty good understanding of whether there's a fit with the fund. Um, so I think that that kind of using that 30 minutes to get me up to speed is probably um, the hardest part, but it's, I think, also the most important part of any deep tech startup. Because if you cannot explain to the people in the room and make the, them understand the value of your company, it's very hard to get them excited. Like, you know, I might get excited because you're really enthusiastic, but like, I need to know where I'm putting my money and what can I expect back, right? So I think this is the, 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 the main difficulty of these deep tech startups is like, so what do you do? We can do everything, okay? Um, how do you do it? We can do it any way you want. <laughs> and uh, Okay. <laughs> so having these kind of discussions, I think, so having a really strong understanding of what is, what is it that we're doing, how are we going to do it? Why are we special? And doing it in very simple, easy terms. So, I think in the in the case of uh, in the case of Lightcode, we do um, software or hardware-enabled software. Uh, so it's slightly difficult <laughs> to make that fit. Um, but but at the end of the day, I think that yeah, communication, good business skills. Clarity about the difficulties ahead are the things that you kind of look for, regardless of what you do as a as, as a founder or an industry that you're in. And I think that that kind of is the I guess for a lot of people, especially coming from academia, can they actually adapt to the business side of things? Um, and then there's you know commercial side, but also then and then the business side. But there's also then leadership and running a business and a company itself. Yeah, you already paved the way from a, from what I wanted to ask from you is that uh, what are what are the most common mistakes when the startups are pitching you, and what would be the advice since uh, whenever the, any deep tech company is pitching, they're so enthusiastic about their technology, and they seem to forget every, everything else. So, what what, what, do you, what can you say? What are the most common pitfalls, for example, and? What would be your advice when reaching an investor and what to include in pitch and what not? I think the easiest one is like, do you actually know who the investor is and what they invest in? And um, it, it, it starts from things like, you know, do they do software or hardware? Do they do pre-seed seed or series A? What are their ticket sizes? Um, do they understand the industry? you know, where we're in, or do I need to explain everything to them? So understanding who your audience is, am I targeting the right investors? That is the basics, but I think you'd be surprised. Um, I think at a certain point where people think like investors are all investors, they're not. There's a lot of variety, and, and I think as you get through it, definitely you'll kind of figure it out like one, one way or another, but it's easier for yourself from like a time perspective to do that research, take that time, and make sure that you're speaking to the right people in the room. I think that when, when, when pitching, I think it's also, um, I don't need to understand the technology in order to understand the business. And I think that, uh, and, and this is what I'm saying, the difficulty for you is that you're a subject matter expert and trying to condense that down to like a sentence is, you know, uh, very, very difficult. But I think that um, having done executive search before and, and having had to think about how to rebrand deep tech businesses and explain them really quickly and simply and get people's attention and how to get them excited about a company, oftentimes, you take away everything of the how, and this is what we do. In one sentence, one line, clear, simple, and then you can add how we do it. You know, the technology and the innovation and enablement and all of that. Yeah, there's a follow-up question from the audience is that, uh, Linda, would you invest in Lightcode Photonics today? If yes, how much and why? <laughs> well, if I had any personal money to invest, I would invest in Heli, of course, and that, that, that is not a question. But I think that um, as an investor, it is like as a fund, um, it's important to stick to a strategy that you know. And I think that it's best 
for the company as well to have an investor that is comfortable with the risks that they're taking and they know the risks that they're taking because imagine at every single board meeting, Heli would have to explain certain things which we're not accustomed to as an investor. We, be, we see risks wherever there aren't any and she would explain, you know, spend a lot of time explaining to us the particularities of her, you know, industry, type of company, etc. So as, you know, seed investor in late seed series A, as well as software, there are, you know, we're really good at long sales cycles, we really understand, you know, these complex engagements, but there are very many particularities of a hardware company where you need the know-how and you need a full-on portfolio from an investor perspective to be, um, I guess, coherent with your strategy in order to make the returns back to our investors. So at the end of the day, we need to make back money. Yeah, and there's another one uh, following your idea uh, to Heli and Donatella. Do you have a slight tech for investors who are not so uh, acquainted with your ideas? And you, you should even tech, tech startup should have this, let's say, two types of uh, pitch techs. The ones who understand everything perfectly clearly and the one who just uh, need, to more, need to be more motivated to uh, understand what you are doing. So from Isa's side, should startup have, like, let's say, two types of pitch decks uh, for investors that know the area and the investors don't know yet the idea? I, I would echo what, what has been said. I think that the most important thing is to let, is, is a matter of language and communication, to let the person in front of you being an investor or being an institution understand what is the job that you are doing to resolve, to solve, to, to fulfill a need. Then you, you, you can structure your presentation in a way, at a certain point you need to get into the detail, but Deep Tech as, is an expert. We have the same problem in ours. We, we try to do commercial and people start explaining the tiny detail on how it is done, the technical, and it can be understood by a small audience. So I think that is, as a matter of fact, you have to be very well aware of what you're doing and for what reason, because this is what gets the buy-in of people who are not as knowledgeable as you are. And, and then you can, at a certain point, you, you have to be specific. You will have in front of you some expert, because in ESA we have expert in the field, or the investor will rely on expert in the area where they want to invest. At this point, you can get into the detail and justify why your product, your service is so great. But at, at the end, if you wanted to get money out of it, you have to explain uh, if people bet on you, what are they, they are going to, to have in return. This is, a, yep. this is extremely important, I think. So, Heli, how many different pitch decks you have and how much you have uh, restructured that over the time from the, all the feedback you've had from investors, from the people in the ecosystem? And uh, do you think yours now is perfect to fit the both criteria, the knowing ones and not so knowing ones? Yeah, I haven't been counting. But uh, enough, <laughs> enough, <laughs> enough. And uh, the best pitch deck is where you have hardly any, like uh, really limited content. And you just uh, catch the attention. Uh, you explain exactly what pain is it solving? What gap is it breaching? And, uh, and then you give the story. Uh, first, you give the financial story that, um, yeah, I can give it in one sentence. In 2030, there will be 15 billion uh, CMOS sensors. I like your technology will be in each. Simple and easy. Did everybody understand? <laughs> yeah, there was a shy clapping. But uh, to elaborate on the idea itself, so we, are, we have heard different views from different people now, uh, from the founder side, from ESA side, from VC side, yeah, and we all talk about synergies. Uh, what do you all, let, let's play around the idea. What could be the perfect, uh, let's say, not, can't say perfect, but near perf perfect uh, the way how investors, ESA, and founders of different space tech deep tech startups could work together seamlessly so there would be no valley of death. And so the startups could evolve to be ready for investors and could have the funds. So just play around the idea. It's a very complex question because uh, 
then I, I, I talk under your control. If you are an investor, you want to see your money back in five years. Space technologies doesn't take five years to get off the ground normally. Uh, I think that there is no magic and there is one, one solution fit all, but for sure in the very early stage you can go through some, this is what we do, we help companies getting off the ground until they are on TRL5 where you start your valley of death through the different programs that help develop uh, your technologies. And at a certain point, and there are some other programs that help you in improving, in, in increasing your TRL. But at a certain point, you have to, we, we can, our uh, role is uh, an enabler. He is uh, enabling uh, the industry to develop. But when you are mature enough, you have to go out and convince investor for the big money. Here also, we, we know that uh, in Europe in general, not only ESA, but in Europe there is a gap. We, we, are, compen we, we are next to our startup and company till uh, a certain stage. But then when, when you go for big investment, there is not that much over there for them. And this is where we try to fill the gap and work more hands in hands with investors because uh, we have different objectives. Investors wanted to see the money. They take risk, but overall uh, they are not throwing money out of the window. They wanted to see a return on, uh, they, on what they do. So I think it's, it's a matter of accepting that these, techno these technologies take longer. You may have higher risk, but ESA is there also to, to support the companies in this development cycle. Now also... your way to retaliate. <laughs> <laughs> not really retaliating. I think that uh, I would I would I would say that I, I think it's not a good idea to aim to have no valley of death. I think that those entrepreneurs who end up there are the most important part of the ecosystem. Yep. Those are the people who are taking the big risks and, and, and they're open to failing and they fail but it's important for the ecosystem overall that you have these kind of, and it's venture capital at the end of the day, you will have failures. And I think that as long as people are testing, they're trying out, they're reiterating, starting a new company, trying it again, that is, the, that is where we want to go to. And I think that venture capital is only meant to help you grow quicker. That's kind of the point, right? So for the, you know, you try, you put in money, you scale, you have another investor. So I think that, the system already works. I think that you know what you can do, and and, and I think what Isa does as well. Uh, but always there's room for improvement. Is making sure that you know you're bringing the information about these companies in front of the investors. That we see all of the companies that could be in our sweet spot. That could be the companies that we invest in, and the good ones we then put the money in. Because there's no point in artificially keeping them afloat either. You know, keep on putting money into inefficient companies just because the technology is cool. Um, so, I think that information sharing, information collaborating. Um, in my personal opinion, that's what made Estonia very successful. We had a lot of successful people who helped you know, the new generation and, and avoid mistakes and, and see ahead more and, and, and kind of make better decisions overall and you know, network and bring them together with others. As long as we keep on doing that and we're actually, you know, exchanging meaningful information, that's the important part. And I think that the mechanisms of communication are always difficult, but, you know, that's why we're here, that's why we're discussing, that's why it's important. So feel free to jump in. Uh, you've, you've heard of Isa's view, investors' view, what is, what's your take on it? How could the ecosystem be better to support you to grow better, faster, and not just be artificially offload, but actually doing things? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, as a startup, I don't have that luxury to say that, <laughs> you know, ecosystem, you should be something different, because uh, that would not work. Uh, and we are not doing it. I mean, we, we only do the things that work. So uh, what we can do is uh, we, just, uh, we just learn. Uh, every experience, every opportunity, I mean, offers you the chance to grow or shrink. Uh, we always have to turn it into opportunity to learn and grow. And uh, it is what it is. 
Uh, if the system today has a systematic bias, for example, that uh, we are supporting the models that uh, amplify software innovation, well, that's it for the time being. And uh, as for ourselves, uh, we just, I mean, we're taking the full responsibility of everything we do. We do only practical things. We do only things that bring us forward. Uh, that's the only approach that keeps us alive. Uh, now, it's like if the ecosystem wants to have more hardware innovation, uh, my personal opinion is that hardware innovation actually um, like, uh, gives a start, a birth, to like, uh, a massive amount of uh, software innovation. As I mentioned, this 3D, we started imagining, so yeah. Uh, but it's eventually, it's the choice of a market, it's a choice of the uh, community, uh, and, and they're voting with their uh, feet and wallet. So if they buy it or not, uh, sometimes you can be ahead of the time, you can be dead because of that, you can be lagging behind and you can be dying because of that. Uh, so um, it is what it is. I don't have the power to change it from outside. I can only change what, uh, what I am, what light code is, what we do, which opportunities to find, which pains we are solving. So, and um, that's simple. Actually, there's a follow-up now with your beautiful thinking uh, from the audience is that uh, as Linda touched the ground of uh, keeping artificially afloat uh, the companies, and there's a question, uh, what are the red flags which uh, stop you from investing in early stage deep tech startup? There's many. <laughs> um, but I think the, the most maybe easiest one or kind of the, the one that's easiest to explain is, um, I think a closed mindset of the founder. I have all the answers. Um, I know exactly what I'm doing. I don't need any input. I just need money. And maybe that's the case. And I'm not like doubting the, you know, the founder, but I think that we work in partnership with the startups that we have. Um, I think we're very uh, kind of aware of the fact that we're not industry experts. Um, so, you know, whenever we give advice or try to support or help, it's always, you know, assume that the founder can still have the final say and they'll do whatever they think is best for their company. But I think that having this element of great discussions and, and, and this openness, and I have to say that in my experience before becoming an investor of working with these founders, I've now kind of years later after having worked with them initially in early stages, you see the ones that scale are the ones who learn. And in order to learn, you need to talk, you need to be open, and you need to be constantly getting in information and filtering it out. So, you know, that's the biggest red flag. I think this like, like you know, you need to be confident and you need to be, you know, you have, need to have a vision. But on the other side, you also need to be flexible, constantly reiterating, moving fast, because that's kind of the name of the game in venture capital, right? Like constantly being nimble, agile, quick, and adaptive. Yeah, and Donatella, a question for you. Uh, will ISA, will at some point take the role of an invest investor and start investing to startups? Well, um, the role of an investor is, uh, is not in our mandate. What, uh, what we are doing is we are investing somehow, not like a venture capitalist, but we are supporting financially uh, companies in a framework which is not uh, the same as a venture capitalist, but because it's in the, our mandate, we are, in, uh, we are uh, an organization and we are spending uh, uh, public money, the money of taxpayer. Uh, therefore, we cannot act as a bank, but uh, we are supporting in a different way within our mandate, the startup. This is what we are doing, and this is... Yeah, so, uh, yeah, and if you think just a, uh, even broader, uh, we are here today, but if you're thinking, let's say, 10 years ahead, when we hopefully there's a, uh, even more uh, developed investment market regarding all the hardware investments and deep techs and uh, the, all the key players know what they're doing. What would be the next uh, big things or how do you see the whole deep tech and space tech industry evolving, let's say, in the next 10 years? And what would be the main uh, directions then where all the developments would be going? Eli. <laughs> Uh, that's a good one. So I think actually, 
acknowledged or not, but this is where the industry and society is going is again uh, a sum of the decisions, the tiny decisions we are making daily. So what I see today in the society is that uh, some people uh, use a lot of manipulation to get what they want. But if it's not, uh, the, my big surprise was this, uh, this big company, Amazon. They always prioritize the long vision. Can you imagine? And, and they are super successful. So it's, it's actually, it might sound like a luxury, but imagine where we all could be if we would do the same. So I, I cannot say that I foresee that future, but I can say that I would like to see that future when we have this uh, common interest and the long vision, uh, long-term benefit and, and sustain sustainability in mind. So that would be a beautiful world to live in. And, uh, but today, the technology we're developing is in a way acting as a mirror uh, to what's inside. So we are often, as a society, consuming over, over and over amounts of different aspects. We waste our time, we eat too much, we spend too much, we spend too much resources. So I think, uh, and, and we don't feel good. We try to feel good through those things, but we don't. And in a way, this technology can help us to overcome this, uh, or it can put us down much further. So I hope that we choose the right path and the technology helps us. Yeah. And, and from ESA's side, as you are sitting on a huge amount of R&D, what do you see the trends now? I think the trends will, will be given by, by the young people today and it will go in the direction of sustainability, green, whatever development we are going to, to start will be uh, supported by, by this. Uh, the, the, I, I don't see other, other way around. Uh, what, do we do? what do you think? Oh, I echo where, where, will, where will be the next big thing? No, I think, I think I echo both of you. I think that, um, to Heli's point, like, the life around us shows us the pain points, right? Um, sustainability, energy, cybersecurity, um, healthcare, you know, all of these things are, are very much on our radar as well. Um, and I think that the companies we invest in today are going to be the big companies in 10 years' time, right? That's kind of the, kind of the model. And I see a lot of our focus going into those directions. And I, and I agree. I think it's the younger generation that is influencing all of us and teaching all of us, you know, the most educated generation yet. And, and I think that much more value-driven and, 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 and maybe hopeful about the world as well, the majority of us. Yeah. And, and I think now on this high hopes note that the young generation will save us, I think I can conclude our little chat here today. So thank you all for joining us on the stage and telling about people about what, what the space tech is, what ESA is doing, and how investors will see uh, the different deep tech and space tech startups. So thank you. Thank you, Sven. Round of applause. Thank you very much to our panelists.